Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open together to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. It's been a while, so you all just need to buckle up and hang on this morning. It's been a while since we've preached here uh, in this particular book. The Lord gave us a great three weeks, didn't He? And we're thankful for all that, that the Lord has done, all the many prayers that, that He's answered. Uh, but if you remember, prior to the Back to Church campaign that we just completed last week, we have been spending our time in the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, the book of 1 Corinthians is a, tip, is a very difficult book. It's hard in the sense that Paul deals specifically with sin, that uh, so oftentimes we find ourselves uh, being prayed to. I was talking to our men this morning, and, and my prayer today is that God would help us understand the importance of God's Word uh, the authority of Scripture. In, in chapter number 7, the Apostle Paul deals with some, some things, really one, one institution, he deals with the home. And as we look back over the previous six chapters, he deals with many things. He deals with a lot of sin, um, the sin of pride. In chapter 6, he deals with the sin of fornication and how we can guard our lives, our hearts against the sin of fornication. But in chapter 7, uh, he deals with the home. And we look at the world today, and, and all the trouble that the world is in, there's no, there's no doubt the world's a mess. You can turn on the news, you see the violence, you see crime everywhere. We were talking in Sunday school, uh, the young adults finally realized how old I am. <laughs> and one of them asked, so what was it like growing up in the 80s? <laughs> so it's like, really, uh, parachute pants were a thing, you know? And how many remember the parachute pants? Uh, here's another one, the mullets, right? Business in the front, party in the back, you know, all this stuff. Uh, really tacky clothing. That was pretty much it. And I told them what, from my childhood, the one thing that we can, without a doubt, just take great pride in was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, that was, that was all the rage. But man, I'm just thinking about all the, the world. And the world is different now than it's, than it, than it's been, isn't it? Uh, we look at society today. I, I told them, my parents allowed me to walk to school when I was in kindergarten. Uh, there's no way I would allow my children to walk anywhere, you know, by themselves now. Whether it's to school, whether it's to the gas station, it's w whatever. We live in a completely different world than we, than we, than we grew up in, than we knew. And it's, and it's only devolving even more so. Uh, the Bible says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. This know also, in the last days, perilous times shall come. However, we have God's word. Amen. I'm not pessimistic. I, I like to think I'm an optimist. I'm thankful that, that God is still sitting on His throne, that He's never abdicated any of His authority, any of His power, that my God is just as able today as He's ever been. Amen. And I want to trust in Him. But may I tell you, some of the, one of the greatest problems that the world faces today is the condition of the home. Right. Our homes are in shambles. The institution of marriage is under attack. Yes. And as Paul writes, he's writing to a, to, a, to a church that was living in a very heathen society, just like you and I are. Uh, sexual immorality was running rampant. The Roman Empire was notorious for, for gluttony, uh, for, for wickedness, for immorality, for sodomy, all of these things. It was, it was gross and it was there. And the city of Corinth was no different. They were very pagan. And, they, and instead of their homes being the place that God intended for them to be, they had allowed themselves to adopt the ideas of the world, the ideas of the, of the culture that surrounded them. And may I tell you, as a Christian, you and I are not called to be like the culture that surrounds us. We are called to be like Christ who is within us. And our, and our prayer, our desire, is that God would help us shift our thinking, to shift our understanding away from this, the worldview that the world promotes. Right? What do they promote? They promote 
uh, all kinds of sexual immorality. What is it? The, the term that sex sells, isn't it? Uh, that that uh, the homes are a wreck. Immorality, promiscuity, just running rampant. Uh, but there's a better way. Yeah, and it's God's way. Yes. Do you want a fulfilled home? Do you want a, a joyful relationship with your spouse? All of these things are are possible, not because you and I are anything great. The reality is we're just as sinful as we've ever been. But the Lord is able, as we yield ourselves to His Word, the Spirit of God who lives within us, as we, as we rely upon our relationship with Jesus Christ, you and I, we can live victoriously in our homes. Instead of adding to the problem of society, they can, they can be a great benefit and blessing to our culture as a whole. If you're able, I invite you to stand with me this morning. We're going to begin reading in chapter 7 and verse 1. We'll read down through verse number 5, and we'll make our prayer. The Bible says this, beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 1. Paul writes, he says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time. That ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Father, we pray this morning for your blessing and for your help. Lord, as we come to the Word of God, Lord, we yield ourselves to it. Lord, we just prayed during prayer time uh, for the offering that we would die to self. Lord, may that be the case today. Lord, we all have ideas, we all have presuppositions and prejudices concerning things. And Lord, our prayer, however, is that the Word of God would win out. That the Word of God would win out in our lives. And Lord, that you would help us. Uh, Lord, we cannot live without Thee. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen our hearts and that we would receive the truth of the Word of God today, that we would take to heart the things that your Word tells us, Lord, that we would apply them and know the full riches of your blessings in our lives and in our homes. And so, Father, we pray that you'd speak to us, and again, Lord, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know Christ, we ask that today would be the day of their salvation. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention to a statement that might seem a little bit odd. You know, just by uh, a general reading, you think, well, why is that verse so important, or why is that statement so important? But it's how the Apostle Paul opens this segment of his, of his letter. The Bible says in verse number one, note the statement, he says, now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me. Why is, we, don't, we don't know what they had written to the Apostle Paul we don't know all the questions that they asked, but we do know the answer that God allowed Paul to bring. And the answer that, that he brings today is concerning the institution of marriage. Now, marriage is a hotly debated subject in society today, isn't it? Why is this? Well, is it not because we have strayed so far from the Word of God? I want you to look with me, if you would, holding your place here in John. Let's go to the beginning of our Bibles Let's go to the, to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter number 2, we find the creation of God uh, described here in chapter number 1. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we're very thankful for God's creation. He created everything on these six days of creation. At the end of the sixth day, uh, God said that it was very good. In the evening and the morning were the sixth day. But on that sixth day of creation, God created something very, very special. Uh, he, had, he had already created all of the celestial things. The, the, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth His handiwork. And God created the sun, the moon, the stars, the seas. He, he created all, the, all the, the creatures that pass through the depths of the sea. He created all the, the fowl that pass through the firmament. But on that sixth day of creation, God created all living things that, that dwell upon dry land. And you know, on that sixth day of creation, God created Adam. He created Eve. 
The Bible says in, in chapter number 1, in verse uh, number 26, the Bible says, And God said, let, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man. In his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. The Bible says, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. If we're to look across the page to chapter number 2, we find that God brings out of chapter 1 and, and describes what He does on the sixth day of creation in, in Genesis chapter 2. And the Bible talks of how God brought Adam and placed him in the garden. And He gave him a job to dress it and to keep it. Uh, we find that Adam was a very intelligent man. He wasn't some Neanderthal. Uh, he was created with complete mental faculties. And may I tell you, he's probably, no doubt about it, a lot smarter than anybody in this room. Yeah. God gave him the ability to name all the creatures, all the animals that, that God had created, Adam had given names to. But the Bible says, in verse number 18 of chapter 2, and the, Lord said, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of uh, the ground, the, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called uh, every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to, the cat, to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help me for him. In verse 21, the Bible says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he, God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from, from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and and were not ashamed. Here we find God's original intent. We find that God created man and woman, male and female. That God brought them together in the union of husband and wife. This sacred union, this first institution of God was the home. And it was not intended for a man to marry a man, nor did God intend for a woman to marry a woman. But God intended man and woman to be wed together. Amen. And all of this falls under the dominion mandate that God had given in chapter number 1. You see, two women, I don't care what science can manipulate, yeah, amen. two women cannot produce a child. Neither can two men produce a child, only man and woman together. And so we find this institution of the home, this institution of marriage, it was not intended to be any other way. Even in the New Testament, both in Matthew and in Mark, the Lord Jesus Christ, when confronted with questions concerning marriage, made statements such as from the beginning of the creation of God, it was not so. He says, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. We see the, the, the definition of marriage as one man and one woman for one lifetime. We see the duration of marriage. Uh, that we see that it's not to be put asunder. That's God's original intent. And may I tell you, I know, the, I know people, there's people here, and I'm not trying to pile on this morning. I hope, you, I hope you understand my heart today. To whomever you're married now, be faithful. Yeah, amen. Right? Just be faithful to God with whom you're with now. It doesn't matter what culture allows. It doesn't matter what 
the world says is normal. We have in our possession today the infallible word of God. And this word is counterculture. What the world deems to be correct, what the world makes excuse for and gives allowance to, I'd rather err with the Lord. Let God be true and every man a liar. But what the Lord is, is working to accomplish here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is the strengthening and fortification of the home. I want you to look with me, if you would please, back in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. And concerning this institution of marriage, not, now every, the home is something very, very special, isn't it? What, what does our marriage represent? Before we read in 1 Corinthians 7, let's look ahead to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 5. Why is, why is marriage so, so very sacred? Well, from the very beginning, God knew that it was a picture. It's a picture of something very spectacular. Something that, that my mind to this day truly can't wrap its mind around. Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. I want you to look in Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible says this, uh, beginning in, uh, let's, let's begin in verse number, um, let's begin in verse number 22. The Bible says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should uh, be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself." For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Why are our homes, why is marriage so special? Because it is a picture of Jesus Christ and the church. It's been said that I might never be able to love my wife to the, to the same extent as Christ loved the church, but I can love her the same way. What did, Jesus, what did the Lord say in Hebrews chapter 13? He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And I know in society today, there are problems that, that swirl everywhere in our homes. And, and, and every home is prone to problems. So long as there are people living in the home, there will be problems. You know who the greatest problem in my home is? You're looking at him. <laughs> ask my wife. <laughs> Don't ask her. <laughs> uh, but in all reality... We, we all, we're sinful. We struggle with pride, don't we? I want to be right all the time, no matter the cost. Right? There, there, are, there, are, there are struggles within the home, within the marriage dynamic. Why? Because of sin. But as we look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, this morning, I just, very simply, I'd like to share with you three simple remedies that will, that will help strengthen your home. Three simple remedies that will help strengthen your home. Look back in chapter 7, in verse 1, 1 and 2, the Bible speaks here, he says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. You know what the first remedy to a strong home is? It's simply that we be committed to our spouses. Be committed to your spouse. There's a, there's a word of warning here in, in, cha in chapter 7 and verse number 1. And the warning is true. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Yeah, 
What was the church in Corinth? What, were the, what was the problems they were facing? There was incest taking place in the church in Corinth. Uh, there was all types of immorality and, and sexual sin. In the Bible, says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Why? Because where does it lead? In our society, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to share something that might seem very radical. Um, in our home, our, our, and granted, our children are still in the home. Uh, my wife and I are in agreement that our children will not date until they're old enough to get married. Yeah. Amen. Um, our, they might, our kids might fight it, but that's the agreement that she and I have come to. Amen. Why? Because it's good for a man not to touch a woman. In our society today, there is so much immorality. Why? Because, and it's even amongst the Lord's people, because we have allowed the world to determine our worldview. Yeah. We, and we don't allow God and His Word to determine our worldview. If God says it's good for a man not to touch a woman, how can I argue with that? Obviously, God is more intelligent than I am. He's, uh, he's omniscient. He's, all, he's a God all wise. And God has my best in mind. Yes, he does. That's right. And so the world will say, you know, it, it's, it's okay. It's okay to, to date around. And I don't want that. I don't want that for my children. Because, you know, we, and we think it's cute, don't we? You know, old, old little Timmy, he's got, a, he's got a girlfriend, right? And you know, on the playground, I remember when, I was, when we were kids, on the, on the, on the playground, you say, uh, you know, Timmy and Sally sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G, right? We think it was cute. But I tell you, it's not. Because it's with what we would think is just an innocent contact, innocent physical contact. But where would that lead? As parents, we need to be very, very careful not to put our children in a compromising position. Right? And I don't want to put my children in a situation where their desires can never be righteously satisfied. It never begins and ends with holding hands. It will always lead to more contact, more physical touch, until ultimately our children, or even us for that matter, are engaged in some type of sexual immorality. But there's a good way. And in our homes, you and I, we need to be committed to our spouses. Husbands, wives, don't allow yourself to be put in a compromising situation. Amen. The only girl I hold hands with, she's sitting back there in the back row. She's my wife. Amen. The only girl I hug... The only girl I kiss, it's my wife. Even when she doesn't want me to. <laughs> Never allow yourself to be placed in a situation where you're alone with a member of the opposite sex. In my own life, I go to great lengths to avoid that. Years ago, I had somebody, of course, in my office, there's a big picture window in my office. You can, you can wave at me when you come in, when you go out. Somebody came in and said, Pastor, you need to put a blind on that window. I said, well, why in the world would I want to do that? I've got nothing to hide. And if I do, you better take that blind down. Right? Because we don't want to be put in a situation where anything could be thought to have happened or could lead to something happening. 
The Bible says, look back in chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, verse 2 says, to avoid fornication. And may I tell you, (laughs) there are many blessings associated with marriage. God said that he would create a help meet for the man. And God took a rib from his side. It's, in, it's interesting that God did not take a bone from, from Adam's foot and fashion the woman so that he could lord over her. Nor did he take a bone from Adam's head and, and to fashion the woman so that she would lord over him. Oh, no, no, no. May I tell you, they're equal. My, hus- my wife and I, we're equal. She's no less important than I am. She's no less intelligent than I am. She's more intelligent than I am, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but we think of all these things. Our wives, our spouses, we're not, men, your wife is not inferior to you. Yeah, amen. You're not superior. This is, this is a help meet. There's equality here. Even in Ephesians chapter 5, the Lord said that, uh, that if you don't love your wife, you really don't love yourself. Never man yet hated his own wife, and you know, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. Even so the Lord the church. Marriage isn't just to avoid fornication. There are many, 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 many more blessings than just that. But may I tell you, husbands, wives... Be committed to your husband, wife. Husband, be committed to your wife. Why? Because that commitment will protect your home from all kinds of hurt and worry. You say, well, well, you don't know. You don't know who I'm married to. Well, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Yeah, but you've got to mow that grass too, don't you? Be committed to your spouse. The Bible says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Be committed to your spouse. Don't let anything, don't let anyone come between you. Notice the second second truth we see here this morning is that you and I must demonstrate our love for our spouses. Demonstrate your love for your spouse. Well, I tell her I love her every day. Well, actions speak louder than words, don't they? Well, my wife, she just doesn't reciprocate. Yeah, she would if if you would genuinely love her, right? If you demonstrate your love for her, she will reciprocate that love. The Bible says, look in verses 3 and 4, it says, let, a hus- let the husband render. Note that word, render. What's the word render mean? It means to give. I must give my wife something. The Bible says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Note those two words, due benevolence. What does the word do mean? It means what they deserve. Your spouse, husband, your wife deserves your love. Wife, your husband deserves your love. It's due benevolence. The Bible says, never let, uh, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. I belong to my wife. You know, it's been 16 years ago that, that we stood in a church building, uh, in the presence of many family and friends, and exchanged wedding vows one to another. The preacher asked me if I would, and I said, I will. My wife agreed to do the same. He asked me if, if, I, if, I, if I would, and I did, you know, and so we got married. Those vows, and we live in a society where where everything, there's, there's always an easy way out of everything, isn't there? What happened to commitment today? You know, we can, 
we can just excuse. We can just, when the going gets tough, man, I'm out of here. But that's not, that's not, that's not Jesus. That's not what the, Lord, what the Lord intends for our homes. He wants us to be committed, but He wants us to demonstrate our love to one another. How much does, does God love us? You ever wonder, is there a limit or is there a cap on God's love? The Bible says, for God so loved the world that He what? That He gave. You know what is a wonderful demonstration of love? Giving. So husbands, go to the flower store after church today, buy some flowers and give them to your wife. That's not what I mean, although you should. Maybe not today, maybe tomorrow. Or maybe wait, let the message wear off. The only reason you're doing this is because the pastor said to. But we need to demonstrate our love to our spouse. What does your spouse appreciate? You should do that. Do, do things for your spouse that will let them know that you've thought about them. But we live in a society where we're so self consumed, we're so self absorbed. And you know what happens when we don't demonstrate our love? Because without question, actions always speak louder than words. But when we go long periods of time and we, and we manifest no love, when we show forth no love, when, we, when we, just, we just cohabitate together, that's all we do, we just live together. You know, we're, we're like two ships and passing in the night. No, it's not what God intended. He wants us to be committed to each other, but He wants us to demonstrate, render the due benevolence. You don't have to go out and spend $15,000 on a trip to Cancun or some other exotic destination. Just let your spouse know that you love them. That you can't live without them. Why? Because... You belong to them. And they belong to you. You're one. Notice the final lesson. I know it's very simple this morning. But notice the last lesson that we see here. It's found in verse number 5. Let's read verse 5 together. It says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. Ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. The last lesson this morning is that we close the door on the devil. Don't give Satan room in your home. It's been said that the devil will walk past your door a thousand times to find it open once. If he can destroy your home, he will. Right. And he'll take great pleasure in it. Yeah, but all of these things work together. And I know there's, there's some younger people in the room this morning, but here he's speaking about the physical component of marriage, the act of marriage itself. And he's saying, don't defraud one the other of what your spouse needs. Because inevitably there will be, well, I guess they really don't love me anymore. Maybe, maybe there's somebody else. And in today's society, all of these things are very possible. Don't allow the devil to have any access to your home. You see, as we look here, the Bible does speak about this, this separation I don't believe in separation. Uh, I don't believe the Bible condones divorce. Well, I believe that, that Moses allowed it because of the cultural pressures of his day. But from the beginning, it was not so. 
I, the people say, well, I, we're just separated. You know, I, I don't believe that's, that's true. I don't think that's right. I don't think it's biblical. The only separation that God's word allows is described right here in chapter 7 and verse number 5. Well, we're just taking a break. You know, we're not getting along. I'm mad at them. They're mad at me. We've decided just to have some space. That's, that's incorrect. What are you allowing when you do that? You're allowing the devil to enter into your home and to divide your marriage and to wreck your home. The only allowance for separation is for fasting and prayer. And 99.9% of all the separations in the world today between husband and wife, I can tell you there's no fasting and prayer going on. And the longer they're apart, the less likely they are to come back together again. Because one or both are not fasting and praying. But Christian, there's, you've, we've got to be very wise. We've got to understand what the Lord would have. Here he, said, he speaks of, in verse 5 he says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. For a time. This is not something that is prolonged. I've seen it. I know I've not been in ministry awful long, but I've been in ministry long enough to see what happens when spouses separate. Thinking of an occasion now, years ago, I was trying to counsel a family through this, and they, were, they lived in the same house, they did not sleep in the same bed, did not sleep in the same room, and eventually that man cheated on his wife, wrecked their home, all because they opened the door for the devil. To come on in, he just rolled out the welcome mat, said, come on in, just wreck our home. And in, in, in our pride, we think, well, I'm justified in my decision. Uh, I've got to do this, I've got to have that. No, 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 no. Understand that, that the Lord has a plan here. And he's writing here to the, to the church in Corinth, he's saying, listen, there's a better way. But do you realize that the best ways often have the most work involved? You've got to work at it. This isn't something that that you just wake up one morning and it's ready-made. You have to work at it. You've got to wake up every morning and say, you know what, I'm committed to my spouse. Because you're going to walk down the street and somebody's going to pass by you and they're going to smile at you. And you're like, oh, I wonder. No, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. You have a, you have a husband. You have a wife. Be faithful to them. Nurture. Nurture that relationship in your home. Demonstrate your love for your spouse. Find times to, that you can go out and be alone if you've got children. Date your spouse. Husbands, on a whim, not today, remember, wait till the, till the message wears off. On a whim, buy your wife flowers. You know what my wife enjoys? Coffee. We've got four boys, and she homeschools. She likes coffee. She appreciates it when I occasionally bring her home a cup of coffee at lunchtime. Just little things. Demonstrate your love. Let them know that you're thinking of them. Help, man, help her around the house. She's not a pack mule. She's not your slave. I'm preaching to myself. Pick up your clothes. And don't just leave them in a pile. Pick them up. Right? But close the door on the devil. 
Don't allow him any entrance into your home. Don't ever, don't give your spouse the occasion to doubt. Let them know you love them. Tonight, we'll continue on in this passage of Scripture. Because he doesn't just end here. There's more to it than just this. But what a good place to start. May God help us today be committed with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.